All right, uh, welcome back everyone to another episode of this personal. It is, I am, I, again, I always say I'm so excited. Today I am, I'm going to sit in this moment for a very, very long time. Um, I have someone who I read and looked up to and admired for so long in this writing game. And I'm just so excited to have a conversation with her. Um, if you don't know who she is, I feel bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> you really, really need to open a book. <laughs> um, I am so honored to have the the privilege to speak to this lady today. Please introduce yourself. And feel free, if you want to list and read, talk about every book that you've written, I am here for it. <laughs> I know you don't have to, but I'm here for it. I've been here for a very long time because... As of the end of last year, I'm up to 106 books. Oh, my God. So we're not going to talk about all of them. That, oh we've been at this for a while. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And for, those of you who, for those who don't know, can just give us a small snippet of, of who you are? Oh, my gosh. I... Well, I'm Nikki Grimes. I specialize in books for children and young adults. But yeah, you need to know I'm sort of all over the place in terms of the ages that I write for and the kinds of books that I write because I bore easily. I can't do just one thing all the time. So I'm writing poetry and fiction and nonfiction. I'm, I've got board books and chapter books and picture books and novels for middle grade and for young adults and occasionally for adults. Um, so I'm, I'm hitting on a lot of different pistons depending on, you know, the subject matter and the voices that come to me. You know, a story will come in a particular voice and I, and I follow whatever that is organically. Sometimes I start out thinking, the story I have in mind is, you know, a picture book. And, mm -hmm. and it just isn't happening as I try to write it. And then I finally understand, oh, wait, the voice of the story is coming to me as a 10-year-old. Oh, okay. This wants to be a middle grade book. Good. And then I follow that. And sure enough, that's what it wanted to be. Sometimes it's for you know, an older audience. And so then I lean into that. So, yeah, I'm very much uh, character driven. Mm -hmm. There's sort of two camps with authors in general, broad generalization, author driven or character driven, plot driven. And you certainly need both elements in every story, but character driven author like myself, that's what I lead with. Sometimes I have a character before I even know what the story is going to be. The character will often suggest the story that I need to write about uh, him or her. And they are very bossy. They will tell me, you will not put those words into my mouth and remind me that the story is coming through me. I don't have nearly as much control as you would think <laughs> because wow. it will tell me, wow. no, uh-uh, I'm not <laughs> saying that. I'm not doing that. That is not who I am. And there are always surprises to me. I have this uh, chapter book character named Diamond, Diamond Daniel, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure where she came from, because she loves math. Math makes sense to her. It's how she makes sense of the world. And I run in the other direction when it comes to math. I chose my university <laughs> based on not requiring higher math. Okay. And then here comes this character. And I'm like, who are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> She's like completely her own person. You know, so yeah, writing is strange. I, oh my gosh, you! I, I again, I appreciate you so much, and I'm going to continue to say this while we're here. Like you, really have set the precedent for quality of writing. 
Um, you write a lot, you have a lot of books, but one of the things I love about you the most is that your quality stays the same. You, you. are so versatile in what you do. Um, and I love Diamond Daniels as an elementary teacher. Uh, we <laughs> love talking about her attitude and how she walks the world. Like we love everything about her. Um, I love, I mean, some of your most recent stuff, like A Walk in the Woods. Like you do such a great job of capturing moments. Thank you. And I mean, yeah, I, I guess I have a lot of questions for you, but my, my question is always like, how do you, one of the questions is like, how do you always do it? How do you always hit the mark? Um, how do you know you hit the mark? Or is that not even something you think about? Because I know you consistently write for black and brown people. Um, I know that is something that is always on your mind when you're um, putting the, the pen to the paper. So I'll, we'll come back to that. But first I wanna know about little Nikki. Who is little Nikki? <laughs> Tell us oh about little God. Nikki. I don't talk about that. You know, I had a really, really rough childhood, come out of trauma, broken homes, grew up in and out of foster care, bounced around a lot. So part of the reason that I write, I mean, I was always fascinated with words from day mm -hmm. one. I used to do word puzzles and jumbles and I'd make up my own games. I'd go to the dictionary and flip through with my eyes closed and I'd pick out a word and then I'd mm -hmm. figure out all the different ways I could use that word. So yeah. I was always about word play and poetry in a very general sense is really word play. And so it was that word play that led me to the genre I'm most known for. Now, yeah. I work in other genres, but poetry is absolutely my first love and my first language. And it's, mm -hmm. You know, I, I go back to it again and again. But I love I love language. I was fascinated with the idea that you could write something down and someone, you could write something funny and someone a thousand miles away could read it and laugh. That mm -hmm. words on paper are that powerful. And so I was hooked in that way uh, early on. And it was for the first, you know, I don't know, 10 years probably, writing was a coping strategy. It was how I got through the world. Reading and writing were my survival tools. And my first writing came out of just being, you know, frustrated and, and full of, you know, rage and questions and just all kinds of mixed up, mixed up feelings and needing to get them out of me somehow mm -hmm. and getting up one night and just feeling like I was going to burst if I didn't get these emotions out and grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and just started to write, you know, what was on my mind, what was on my heart, what, you know, the, the feelings I was having. And at the end of it, realizing while nothing had changed, I felt lighter. Mm. And I could breathe. And I realized I've hit on something. I wasn't old enough to be able to articulate it, but I knew whatever this thing was, it was magic and I had to hold on to it. Wow. Wow. You know? and so I yeah. would go back to it, you know, again and again. I love that. And I think I talk about it. I've talked about it before, how writing is such a form of like liberation. It can really allow one to release so many things that have influenced us. And I really, really love that. I really, really love that. I think that is so important to share. I think it's great that you were able to find that. Nikki, were there people around you during that time influencing you to write? All right, what I talked to you about, I wrote about in a poem called Isolation Station. 
in uh, my memoir, Ordinary Hazards, which you, have you read this? Yes. <laughs> okay. This was the poem that try, where I tried to capture that. The house was full, but with strangers. And I was there by myself in the dark, in a tiny pocket of a room, with a tiny bed to sleep in, and little space for the fears I'd packed in my suitcase, which makes no sense because why would I bring them with me? And the night sounds far into the city girl left me tossing and turning. There was no more room in my head to hold the anger rising like steam, searing the edges of my brain. There was not even a shelf where I could stack the questions, crying out for answers that wouldn't come. Why did mom have love liquor more than Carol, more than me? Why did daddy let strangers take us away? Why did grandma refuse to come to our rescue? Why didn't they love us? Why didn't anyone love us enough? Why, 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 stop? I leaped out of bed, switched on the light, grabbed the piece of paper and a pen, Stab the page and let my thoughts gush like a geyser shooting high into the moonless sky. Then falling down on the page, I held captive till every line was stained with my feelings. And the heat of them finally had a chance to cool and suddenly I could breathe, breathe, breathe. And there was, once again, room enough in my head and my heart to just be. Then I closed my eyes, and it was morning. Gosh, it, it captures so many moments and feelings and it says so much about you as a writer like that alone like you you did it if, if if you were to tell if someone was to ask you what is your story and you were to give them that that really gives them such an image of so much of why you started writing so much of the things that you had to you know just face at such a young age and i think it's such a testament to to who you are as a person today um, you. because you were given every choice not to to write not to lean into the things that that you love the most and what 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 continues to inspire you to be creative to evolve as a writer during today because again as you mentioned before like you have over like 100 books and you've done so much. Like what makes you continue to feel inspired to write today? Well, for one thing, I'm always looking for something new. I really appreciate and embrace a challenge. And I mean, <laughs> there's plenty of them in the world. There's lots of things still to write about uh, and to explore. But I, I have learned of the value of walking into my fear. So if I get an idea for something and it scares me, I know that's exactly the thing I need to lean into. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to grow in a way that I wouldn't otherwise by following that path. Um, and I still do at times write to work through things. I came back very much to almost daily writing uh, during the early days of the pandemic because it just was so wild and, you know, the protests were going on and just all of it was just so much. And I found I had to write just to kind of cope. And it was really interesting because I, I would post some of these poems online and I found out they were doing for other people what they were doing for me as I was trying to work out something for myself and I was sharing it. Other people were saying, yes, that was what I'm feeling too. Thank you for saying that, you know, mm -hmm. thank mm -hmm. you for giving me the words for, for what I'm feeling right now. So I, there's still that element of it, 
but there are just there are still so many uh, intersectionalities that that have never been written about, especially in the field of children's literature, but in general. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited about a book coming out, I think next year. It's hard to keep up. <laughs> I Years ago, I'd done a, a picture book biography mm-hmm. of Bessie Coleman, the pilot. And in researching her, I discovered that her father was Choctaw. And so then I started thinking about this character who was Black Choctaw and playing with an idea for a picture book about him. And it ended up in a file. I forgot about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I completely forgot about it De- for decades. And then wow. last last year, the year before, mm-hmm. I started working on my um, estate planning. And so one of the, part of that was going through my files so that I could identify literary product for anybody who comes after me so they don't have to go through every file. I have a lot of files to figure out where, you know, where the literature is. That meant I had to read things. I still have to do more of that. I haven't gone through all my files, but so I started this process. And in one of the files was this story um, about this kid who, who um, was afraid of the dark and, the way his his mom dealt with it was to introduce him to uh, the dream catcher, right? And so it was a story about that. So I come across this thing a couple decades later, whatever it is, and I realize I don't even know if I get to tell this story now because the landscape has changed. We're all about own voices. Do I even t- you know? Do I even get to, to tell the story now? So I contacted um, one of my native friends, and I said, who's, a, who's an author, and I said, Sin, what do I do with this? You know, and I tell her about it, and she says, send me a copy. And she reads it, and she comes back with a couple of suggestions. And one of them is to, um, is to collaborate with a Choctaw author. And there's somebody who she's been mentoring who does middle grade. She's never done a picture book, but, you know, she said, you know, check it out. And, um, and I said, you know, that's interesting to me. So we met online and talked and we clicked immediately. And so we, we started working on this and I ended up revamping the story. I, I set aside the whole original story because I realized, well, first of all, you know, other people have written about dream catchers. It's not mm-hmm. like, and and I was going to work to, we were going to bring in elders and make sure we had the, you know, the the, the uh, permission and authority to, to do the subject matter. But I realized in the process, wait a minute, there's something else going on here that's more important. There Mm -hmm. are no books about Black Indigenous characters, period. Mm -hmm. Let's Mm -hmm. lean into that because that matters, right? So I changed up the story, and now it's about same emotional issue. He's dealing with fear. But instead, the the response this time is his mother introducing him to ancestors on both sides of his family who proved to him that he comes from such strength. He has no reason to be, to be afraid of dreams on his mother's side of the family. There's an ancestor who survived the trail of tears on the father's side of the family. It's an ancestor who survived the Tulsa race massacre. Oh my. So I can talk about both things. This is in your archives. <laughs> I right. so oh I get to talk about both things in this um, in this picture book, oh and um, that Stacy and I now worked on together, and and I'm just so excited about it. But it also woke me up to the fact that there are all these other people groups. Mm-hmm. You know, we have there are so many intersections of, mm-hmm. of black people with Japanese, with Italian, with you name it, yeah. and. Yeah. 
you go to the shelf, you don't find them anywhere. So there's wow. all these people groups left that we still need to, you know, bring into into the literary fold, into the canon, uh, and also moving in another direction to encourage the uh, storytellers among these groups to start writing their own stories. So there's tons to, to, to keep me excited and motivated <laughs> and inspired for longer than I'm going to be here. <laughs> I would pay big money to look at your archives. <laughs> <laughs> I would pay big money to do that. <laughs> Nikki, you do such a great job online. I have two questions for you. Number one is I think you you do such a great job online talking about your highs and lows. Um, mm-hmm. For someone who is so accomplished as a writer, you still share about manuscripts not passing or deadlines. And I think that's one of the other reasons why I enjoy you so much because you keep it so real. For someone who again, is so accomplished, you still share that. You can still struggle, like you're still human. You don't just share your wins online. And I I really, really appreciate that. For someone who is very new into publishing, seeing someone like you talk about those experiences and how you navigate them um, has been very, very helpful for me. Um, So I I really, really appreciate that um, because it makes you human. Um, which you are, right? It just makes sense. Like in in my mind, it's like she's a superhero. <laughs> she is like <laughs> flying through brick walls and knocking it. But of course, you have moments where a manuscript doesn't work or everything isn't going the way that you want it to. And and you do a really good job of just letting us know that online. And and again, I appreciate that because not everyone does that. And I mean, they don't have to. Um, but for really? someone like you, it, it really shows um, who you are as a person. Thank you. Yeah. And everybody yeah. struggles with things, you know, this whole mm-hmm. mystique of, well, you know, you just get that, that first contract. And after that, you know, it's you're sailing and you know, everything yeah. is wonderful and automatic. And like, no, you yeah. talk to Jane and Jane talks about this all the time. Jane Yolen, who's mm-hmm. what is her book count is like close to 500 at this point. I mean, she's Uh been here since forever. And she constantly was, well, have these posts where she says, yeah, well, you know, two things rejected today, but I got one. Yes. You know, something else. And and people are like, what? (laughs) You know, like, yes, this this is life. It's, you know, this is what goes with this territory, you Mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And so you just have to figure out, how are you going to navigate it and who you are and whose you are and understand mm-hmm. that and work, you know, from that space, you know, and you just keep going. Yeah. Um, and if you're not prepared for that, it really puts you at a disadvantage. I don't want people to be at a disadvantage. This business mm-hmm. is hard enough when you know what you're doing and you know all of that. Yeah. And if you don't know these things, it just, you know, for some people, it becomes impossible. And for that reason, I started working a couple of years ago. I was I was ill for like a year, a little mm-hmm. over a year. And almost died twice. Didn't know if I was still going to be here. Gosh. And I, I was really driven to start work on a book that I was like, okay, this may be the last book I get to write, but I have to write it. And it's a, a book about the children's book business um, that breaks it down, you know, what the highs and lows are, what the struggles are, just really basic things. Why and how to read a contract, you know, mm. why and how to read royalty statements, you know, things like that. But also talks about um, side hustles, you know, and look at the different things that various authors do to make a living while they're, you know, pursuing their art to things like self-care and what that looks like when you're in this business and why, you know, it's an important thing. So it's, and it's, it's very, (laughs) As my editor says, it's a very robust book, 39 chapters worth. Wow. 
was like, wow. But, and I and I was really driven to write this thing because I kept waiting for like an MFA program or an art program to start teaching the business, you know, decade after decade. And it's not, not happening. And people are wrestling with the same things now that they were when I first came into the business, what, 47 years ago. I said, this, this is ridiculous. And wow. you have people who are burning out, some who leave the business, you know, out of frustration, people who aren't earning as much as as they should because they don't even understand their value in the marketplace. And all of these things have to do with a lack of knowledge, a lack of information. That's ridiculous. If you're going to leave the business, leave for some other reason, not because you don't know something, you know, that is knowable, you know, now I understand that a lot of artists are allergic to business Mm-hmm. And so even when they have the information, might not follow it. That's Then that's on them. Mm-hmm. But I want to make sure people have it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and so that's been like my biggest project for the last couple of years. Um, and that's I scheduled that. for publication that's next August. I love that. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting because like you – the, it, I like the next question was actually you often tackle tough conversations or difficult themes, um, but you craft them in a way that really resonates with young readers. But at the same time, you can give it to an adult, a young adult, a middle schooler, um, and there I'm talking specifically about your picture books. What is the process of you doing that? Because that is, it, like, for one, not everyone can do it. <laughs> and number two, you do it in a way that makes it so universal at the same time, right? So you have this difficult topic, but at the same time, you're able to make it in a way that it really is able to connect with all facets of life. Like, what is your process for that? Is there, what's the magic, Nikki? What's the magic? Well, I don't know about magic, but <laughs> I always seek to climb into the skin of the character I want to write about, to mm-hmm. look at the world through his or her eyes, mm-hmm. from his or her perspective, and then to do the storytelling from that place. Because if I do that, it's going to be true. Can you say that again? I love that. Can you say that again? <laughs> I climb into the skin of uh-huh. the characters I want to write about so that uh-huh. I can look at and speak about the world through their eyes from their mm-hmm. perspective. And if I do that, it's going to be true. And if I, it might, if it takes me a minute to like get into that headspace, well, then I read and I look around me and I talk to the young people in my life and you know, that, that voice is always there. They're they're all around me. I don't have to look far to find them, but I, sometimes you just have to tune your hearing into, you know, that character, that, you know, child of that particular age that you want to that you want to address. And of course, I I go back to my own childhood, which is very much a lie for me. Mm-hmm. So I can tap you know tap into that. But when mm-hmm. it comes to making sure the the language, the dialogue aligns with what kids are using at that moment. I'm listening to the kids around me for that. I can tell. I can yeah. totally tell. I can totally tell. Because you're you're every time you release something, whatever calendar year that is, it's so fresh and it's so relatable. And of course, like it's it's the only way that it could be relatable if you're still tapped into the culture and what kids are into and how they're navigating things. And I love that about you so much because you, you continue to grow for who you are. You still continue to grow and that's growing, like being able to be like, Hey, I'm not going to just like do what I did many, many years ago. I'm going to continue to like push myself to, to reach the kids of today as well. And you do such a phenomenal job of that. You're just, inspiration for generations for young readers and writers will continue to grow for forever what do you what advice would you offer those who are you know 
seeking similar long lasting like impact in regards to like body of work because your body of work is i mean we talked about it early on is like top tier what 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 advice would you have to to young writers that are trying to to do similar One thing I always like to encourage is that you read broadly. Don't just mm. read the particular genre you're interested in. Read everything because every genre has something to teach you. Mm. And you don't know what might work for you, what might click for you, unless you explore it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to try different things. It doesn't cost you anything to try. Maybe you have an idea and you decided you're going to write it in a particular way, but, but try it a few different ways. Maybe change up the character who's the main speaker. Try a different gender than you usually write through and see mm -hmm. what that might open up for you. Mm -hmm. You know, and don't, don't be afraid to do that. We learn so much in play. Mm -hmm. Remember to play always. You're going to learn things as you play. Mm -hmm. And but that that reading piece also is huge. Read all kinds of books by all kinds of authors. You will find some that are closer to your voice and pay attention to those because people always ask, you know, what do you do when if you get writer's block? I tap into those voices. For me, there are three people I go to if I am blocked. It doesn't happen often, but if I am blocked, I will read a little. Lucille Clifton or Gary Soto or J. California Cooper, any of those will take me back to my own voice. Just a few pages and something will open up, click, and I'm like, and the, I'm back where I need to be. Mm -hmm. And as you read as you're reading, you will figure out who those authors are for you. Um, and have them sort of, you know, just in your back pocket. So mm -hmm. you get to that place where you're stuck. And just read a little bit of, of those particular uh, authors, and, it, and that will always shake something loose. Thank you yeah. for that. I think that is such great advice. And before we go again, I want to just share how much I appreciate you as a writer who's just released their first book in October, and someone who Yay! has... You, you are that person for me. When I am not having a voice, I look at your work, and I... I'm always trying to read as a writer and I am constantly looking to see like, what, what would Nikki do? <laughs> what would Nikki do? That, that's what I asked myself. What would Nikki do? So I'm honestly cherishing this moment so much because you are someone who I genuinely enjoy and appreciate. And you are constantly sending the elevator back down and reaching out and sharing information and I just appreciate the space that you've created for writers, um, because if it wasn't for you, people like me wouldn't have had opportunities. Um, your voice is so important in this work, um, and I appreciate it so much. So um, okay. from the bottom of my heart, I really genuinely do appreciate you, and I thank you for spending time with me today. My pleasure. Yeah, you were awesome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, Nikki, where can, I mean, again, I hate asking this, but there may be people out here who are, you know, not sure what's happening in the world and who this is, but <laughs> Nikki, where can people find you online? If people are looking for you online, where can they find you? You can find me at Twitter, which I refuse to call by that other name. <laughs> <laughs> You're so tapped in. You are so tapped in. <laughs> and on Facebook. And you can also find me on Instagram. <laughs> awesome. And active, like very active too, which I think for a lot of authors, I mean, I get it. Being active online can be very difficult because you are working with, I mean, you're just writing. Oftentimes you also still have other jobs and it's busy, right? Yeah. So but oh, yeah. you are often pretty active, which I appreciate too. So um, thank you for your time. Is there books that you would like to share that you have coming out? like soon is there things that you can share well not this year i mean next year i have a couple coming out i have 
let's see. I think in January, what do I have? Glory 2, mm. which is a follow-up to Glory in the Margins. And that's for adults. That comes out, I believe, in January. Yay. And, yes. of course, Stronger Than, that was the uh, story I talked about with um, the uh, Black Indigenous character. Mm -hmm. His name is Dante, mm -hmm. by the way. <laughs> and uh, one called uh, A Cup of Quiet, because I'm very much concerned with books that show Black characters engaging in nature. So this is another book along those lines. Um, that's what A Walk in the Woods was about. That's what Southwest Sunrise was about, moving into that space. So um, those are coming out. And then, of course, the, the big book at the uh, next fall will be the business book, which I originally called B is for Business, and then it had a long second title. And the publisher uh -huh. has already told me they want to change the title. So I don't know what it's going to be called. But it's coming. All we know is it's coming. <laughs> I know it's coming. <laughs> we appreciate you so much um, sending all of the flowers your way. Um, and I'm sending yeah. you all the best wishes as well. Um, I want you to write in liberation, in enjoyment, as much and as long as you want to. You've already given us so much. Um, and we are very lucky, very, very lucky to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.